Welcome back to the Business Leaders of America podcast, where business leaders come to share their advice and journeys to success with existing and emerging leaders of America. Join us as we delve into the minds of these accomplished individuals, uncovering the strategies and insights that have propelled them to the top. Whether you're an established leader or an emerging force in the business world, this podcast is your go-to source for the knowledge and inspiration needed to navigate the dynamic landscape of American business. Now, here's your host, Dylan Bloyd. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Business Leaders of America podcast. Today's guest is Meredith Alexander. Meredith is a top mindset life coach and the founder of Grit Mindset Academy, where she trains high-level clients to tap into the top 1% through motivation, self-empowerment, more happiness, and success through a winning formula. She is a best-selling author, powerhouse entrepreneur, and most importantly, the caregiver to her daughter, Skylar, who suffered a tragic accident while on an adventure trip to Colombia during a fellowship in Peru. Meredith's extensive background in both marketing and peak performance has allowed her to help clients of all ages, backgrounds, and circumstances identify even more of their true potential and create the powerful action plans so they can finally move from talking about their goals to actually realizing them. Meredith, thank you so much for joining today. I am excited to be here, even more excited because you got the pronunciation of Skylar's name <laughs> correctly. That puts you in a whole new category. Kudos. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yes. Did a little bit of research. Ah, well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to be here with your listeners. Before we get started, if you wouldn't mind taking us through that day you received the news about your daughter, Skylar, it is just such an impactful story. Sure. Yeah. You know, it was interesting, Dylan, because I thought I was this kind of normal entrepreneur. I woke up that day and I was in the middle of a busy season. I had calls to make. I had my call sheet. I had numbers to hit. It was like chasing, chasing, chasing. And um, all of a sudden at 3.15 in the afternoon, my phone rang and it was an international number. And I thought, who could be calling me on an international number? That can't be right. And yet I answered it anyway. And from that very first breath, that very first inhale, I knew, and it was uncanny. I just knew that my life was about to change. And I will always hear my daughter's friend's little voice saying, Miss Meredith, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but Skylar has been in a terrible accident, a a boulder just fell off the side of the mountain and I don't know if she's going to make it. And I remember, I remember just thinking, oh my God, why me? And the, and it wasn't a why me for me. It was why me for my daughter. It was like, why did she get me for her mom? Because at that time I was thinking, I don't have enough. I don't have enough money for this. I don't, I'm not strong enough for this. I don't have experience for this. She's in freaking Colombia. I don't even speak Spanish. And it was this feeling of all sorts of conflicting emotions. It was feeling inadequate. Mm -hmm. It was feeling just absolutely devastated, as you can imagine. It was anger. It was grief. It was disbelief. And yet, as I sat on that plane flying down to Colombia just a few hours later that day, I realized that by far of all the horrible feelings that I was feeling, by far the worst was feeling powerless to help my daughter. And here's the Here's the crazy thing, Dylan. What I realized was that I had had a lifetime of boulders, just maybe not literal boulders. Mm -hmm. 
But I had had so many boulders in my life that they had pushed me in the direction of diving so deeply into why do some people face these incredible obstacles and emerge as bigger, bolder versions of themselves when other people appear to be crushed by it. And I committed that I would do whatever it takes to learn how to play the inner game to win. So that for me was one of the most spectacular synchronicities that could have happened because one thing that I learned that when you are in the middle of a boulder shower, mm-hmm. when that when that boulder that's been on the side of the mountain for millions of years decides to fall on freaking you, that's not the time to say, oh, maybe I should focus on my inner game, right? Right, right. And that was one of the most profound things that I began to realize. And so as a result, when I'm sitting there and we are flying to that place where now my daughter is fighting for her life, her that boulder cracked open her skull, crushed her lungs, fractured her spine, fractured both scapula, snapped her right thigh into, crushed her left ankle. I mean, these are injuries that people don't survive from. And so I had been prepared to be coming down, hopefully to find that the doctors had been able to keep her alive long enough for me to say my final goodbye. So I had to make a decision. One, what was I going to invest in which meant what was I going to make this mean? So Skylar had been this incredible, I mean, her middle name literally means <laughs> happiness in Japanese. Oh. So she was this vibrant social enterprise dynamo who had already been to five out of the seven continents. She was fearless. I mean, she was she was the one in the family that, you know, rappelled down the waterfalls. There was nothing she would say no to, right? And yet there she was fighting for her life. So the big question was, how was I going to serve her legacy? How could I find some sort of epicness within myself so that if there was a prayer that this child of mine could see a miracle in her life that I would be able to amplify that by having some sort of power to help her. And so that meant I really had to make a choice. Knowing what I knew about the inner game, was I going to identify myself in that moment as I walked into that hospital and stood next to that hospital bed? Was I going to identify myself as the mother of a child who had been ruthlessly crushed by a boulder at an early age, or would I identify myself as the mother who had been blessed to have been the mother of a child who in just 22 years had already impacted the world so profoundly in a way that most of us don't get to do in 80 years. And oh, by the way, her story's not over yet whatever that means. And so that, of course, was the decision I made was saying, okay, okay, world, I get it. I cannot control this outer game stuff. I cannot undo the boulder. I certainly cannot operate on my my daughter. I cannot play. I cannot control this outer game. I get it. But I can freaking play a mean inner game. So game on. And that really was the beginning of applying these inner game strategy skills, the the masteries, I call them, Mm -hmm. that are life defining. And when we embrace them, they help us tap into a kind of magic that without these catastrophes in our life, we might never see. Wow. 
you're absolutely right. How easy would it have been to just go the other way? Because that's majority of what people do. You know, I mean, that's immediately the response is to go the other way and be, you know, why me? Why my daughter? And it's over from there. That hits so close to home. I have five kids of myself and I can only imagine the feelings that you were going through going there and how long of a trip that probably was, was just heart wrenching the entire time. So you were incredible. You were so strong. And thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. I I appreciate that, you know, and and I really, as much as I would like to take credit for that, I firmly believe that we are, when we are pointed in the right direction, that epicness is not reserved for mm-hmm. a select few. We're not we're not either born with it or we're not. It is like any sort of mastery when we are guided in the right direction, when we understand. So for example, if I may, let me show you, like for me, for example, when I made that decision, Mm -hmm. right, that I was going to play the inner game to win, I had to say, okay, what's the next step then? And that meant that I had to start asking myself some different questions Mm -hmm. because I knew three things, three Three things, three three questions I knew that whenever we are bumping up against any sort of obstacle, these three questions are non-negotiable. We must ask them of ourselves. And the first is, what can I control? Right? What can I control? Because the ludicrous thing is we spend so much effort and emotional investment trying to control things that are un freaking controllable. Right. We try to control the world around us and we are completely oblivious to the one thing that is absolutely our responsibility to control and that is our inner name, our our inner game, right? Mm-hmm. And our what we are how we are defining ourselves, our own identity, right? right. And and so the second then question becomes what can my mind believe? Because you know, whether you're thinking of Henry Ford and his very famous quote, you know, if you believe you can or you cannot, you're right. Yes. If we are to achieve something, we have to get our mind to the place where it believes that it is possible, that it can be done, we can do it, and it will be worth it. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is probably the most overlooked question of them all, and that is, What might I be assuming right now that is not necessarily true? And in that case, the assumption was, of course, because all these experts were telling me that what Skylar experienced was unsurvivable. Well, therefore, she will not survive. Well, that is still an assumption Mm -hmm. because regardless of medical precedent in the back, this moment with this child under these circumstances have not taken place yet. And so how do I get to the place where I can kind of see the possibility of the miraculous? Well, it meant I had to get my mind to a place where I could believe it was possible. And that led me to some different questions. The first one was, has anyone ever achieved something that everyone else said was impossible? Well, that was life with its most ironic sense of humor, because there I was at 30,000 freaking feet in an airplane. There was a time when that was totally not possible, Mm -hmm. right? And so there my mind was in a place where it could believe and say, yes, that has occurred. And then it was a tiny step to say, okay, has any other human being ever experienced a miracle? Well, I mean, Skylar and I were one of the episodes on this entire show called The Miracle Show, right? I mean, miracles are around us on a regular basis. So that was a yes, too, right? So it's a matter of not flipping it, right? What we tend to do, Dylan, especially as leaders and even in the professional world, is we believe that in order to be, quote unquote, realistic, Mm-hmm. That we have to wait for life to show us evidence that comes from out there, outside of ourselves, so that we can shift what we believe. Whereas, right. I mean, case after case after case proves that 
It's the reverse. We have to believe that it is possible. And guess what? Evidence tends to pop up, even extreme cases like my daughter, where medical precedent going back thousands of years said, no, this is not possible. And yet to jump to the end of the story, she, she survived the unsurvivable. Yeah, she is truly a miracle. Yes. And she is absolutely lucky to have you as a mother as well, because again, that could have been obviously the opposite, you know, could have went completely the other way. And you saying that, you know, why does she have me as a mother? She is very, very lucky to have you. And of course, you're lucky to have her as well. Before I go any further, I did want to actually touch on a few of her accomplishments. Sure. Just just to give the listeners an idea of how incredible of a person Skylar is. So yes. b- before the accident, in her freshman year at Yale, she traveled to Tanzania to teach English with art. When she returned, the experience impacted her so greatly that she launched a Yale branch of the global organization Net Impact. For anyone who doesn't know what the Net Impact organization is, they mobilize next generation leaders to use their skills and careers to make a positive impact on the world. They now also have over 400 chapters worldwide. By Skylar's senior year, she had become a spokesperson for Net Impact and had been recognized as the top branch in the world. That is unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And she now continues to defy all odds and inspire thousands around the world. Meredith, you have such an incredible daughter. Oh, she is. She is. She's. Yeah. Yeah. She is my she continues to be my inspiration. She's my dynamo. She is what I call my epic booyah every day. (laughs) It's unbelievable. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) And. She's just getting started. Right. (laughs) You're absolutely right about that. All right. Well, uh, after all that, let's see if I can focus on the rest of this conversation. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) All right. Bring it on. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Bring it on, Dylan. (laughs) So can you please give us a brief background, um, an intro on yourself and how you got to where you are today um, before the accident, after the accident now? Can you give us an idea of what goes on with Meredith's life? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so this version of me post Boulder is, was not at all, not at all the version of me, even hours before the Boulder. And it's uncanny how something becomes so pivotal that it can either really devastate you and leave you as kind of a shell of maybe a version of yourself, or it can propel you to a new place. So, you know, the version of me before, academically, I had the best of the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, (laughs) I was the crazy student. If I did not get a hundred, Dylan, I (laughs) was pissed. Really? (laughs) I, I just was really great at figuring out the patterns in academia. That was good. And so <laughs> that catapulted me into the world of prep school. So I went to one of the, uh, the at the time I went there, it was the top ranked prep school in the United States, oh. Phillips Exeter Academy. And it was only the fifth year that women slash girls mm-hmm. had been admitted Prior to that, it had been an all-boys school. We weren't even allowed to go in ninth grade. We had to join the group in 10th grade. And it was one of the most high-pressure environments I had ever experienced. It was crazy. And yet, once I got older, I realized what a gift it really had been because it had taught me to quest. Um, From there, I went to Georgetown University thinking that I was going to maybe be a diplomat. I was going to go into the foreign service. And and that began to shift and change because the more that I went through academia, the more I realized that there was one big question that with all the knowledge I was being given and all the things the adults told me that I should and should not do, There was one glaring question that everyone seemed to be skirting around, and it was how to choose to live. Hmm. Very simple, but it was more than what are you going to do when you grow up? There were plenty of people offering advice of, well, here's what you should do, but to look around at people and see people who embodied being happy doing what they do, it was very small. And so 
even at that point in my life, I really started questing. And it didn't take long after traveling around the United States and Canada for about literally nine months in my truck, pretending it was an RV, where (laughs) I eventually hopped from a few places, really trying to figure out who it was, what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. And I started this accidental string of entrepreneurial experiences. And when I say accidental string of entrepreneurial experience, it it was things like um, my mother asked, said, why don't you make me this beautiful collage brooch for Christmas? And being the little perfectionist that I thought I was at that time, I thought, sure, I can make my mom a brooch, but if I make her a brooch, what earrings will she wear? (laughs) Let me figure out how to make earrings. Well, so I was living in New York City at the time. And of course, I wasn't going to make earrings for me and my mom's style. So this was the age I'm kind of dating myself slightly (laughs) pre-Madonna when it was all like Monet jewelry, which meant silver or gold. That was it. And so I, as you can tell, your listeners cannot see me, but I have a pair of what is called eyeglass leashes on. So I am very bright color, always have been sparkly. No, Legally Blonde was not about me. It was not based (laughs) on my story because I did not have a dog at Georgetown. Oh, man. So I made these little earrings that had like feathers and Austrian crystals and toy dinosaurs on them. So they were very different. And people started buying them off my ears. I would literally make it a block or two in New York and someone would stop me. Celebrities started getting them. So before I knew it, my stuff was like in Bloomingdale's and in some of the top boutiques around the country, which was really, really cool. So that business lasted for a while until I started having my family. And then, you know, the changing moment for me was when I walked into my son's third grade And the teacher said, oh, my gosh, he loves you so much. His only complaint is that he never sees you. Well, (laughs) so anyway, (laughs) one thing led to another. And I moved into a very successful performing arts booking agency. Meanwhile, always studying the inner game, inner game, inner game, inner game. And um, I was a single mom. And, you know, the the that's the external story. The underneath the surface story was that my self-esteem had plummeted because I had not found the answer of how to choose to live. I had gotten to the point where I felt like so many dreams had been crushed in my life that I felt like that little voice was the enemy inside of me, never to be trusted again. And I felt like that it was almost like laugh with life was like sneering at me and it would dangle something that my little inner voice would say, oh yes, this is your it. This is your it. And then whack, it would get slapped away. So I got to the point where I thought, you know what? I'm not going to chase any dreams anymore. I'll just chase a a living. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so I had this very outwardly successful business of my own that I had at the time of the boulder, but I was miserable. I was miserable. I felt like the faster I moved, the more I failed. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I could never be enough. There was nothing I could do to prove to myself that I was worthy. And, you know, I was running a very real risk of getting to a place in my life where I would look back and feel like I never lived. Whereas that boulder I often say that that boulder brought with it more than a lesson in how to face death. It taught me how to choose to live. Mm -hmm. And it taught me that we have one goal and one goal only. And anyone that I work with, my clients will tell you whenever they say goal, I'll go, "Eh, eh, eh, not yet. Yeah. One goal. And that is to be taking our last breath saying, oh my gosh, this was freaking awesome. I hope I get a chance to do this again. Anything else along the way is an objective, a target, an opportunity, possibility to iterate. Because when we torment ourselves with goal after goal after goal, the association we have with that word typically 
mm-hmm. immediately throws us in the back seat, like the kids who are like, you have five kids. You understand this. Are we there yet? Are yeah. we there yet? Are we there yet? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and so every morning we wake up and go, goal, goal. Oh, I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. So we start our day half alive, feeling like a failure, feeling like we're not enough, all because we haven't supposedly hit this one thing mm-hmm. that will give us permission to feel good about ourselves. Right. Right. No, you're absolutely right. You only get one chance at this life. You you have to absolutely live it to the best of your ability. And if you're sitting there constantly worried about chasing the next thing or being so fixated on money, and then one day, like you said earlier, when you wake up one day, you're going to be like, did I even live life? Did I even enjoy it? So no, you're absolutely right. So can you dive a little bit into what Grit Academy is? Grit Mindset Academy really is geared toward the two different kinds of professionals, right? That the one is the professional who thought that they knew exactly where their life was going to be 10, 20, 30 years ahead. And then all of a sudden they wake up and realize that they are not at all where they thought they would be. And the clock is ticking and they have no idea what to do next they suspect that they're the problem. And so th- they they classify themselves as I am freaking stuck. The other person, the other professional that I work with is interestingly enough, the person who is exactly where they thought they would be, but they do not feel what they thought they would feel when they got there. So this is what I really, really believe thanks to our friend, the Boulder, is that we all have the capability of unleashing this epic expression of ourselves. And it's the perfection in that is not, again, a stagnant, boxy destination. Perfection, if you look at the world around you, is the ability to be agile and adapt and flow. We as human beings are still here today, not because of our ability to combat change and contain change, but because of our ability to adapt to it. And again, to flow and to get creative has and allow ourselves to iterate and flow and move. And that's when we are at our best, when things stay the same, when we try to prevent change, you look at anything in nature, that's when the water becomes dangerous to drink. So Grit Mindset Academy is really tailored to helping those those professionals in those categories to figure out, to identify their three elements, how to identify not only where they are, but who they are. That is really typically a missing piece when we're stuck, when we're feeling like, oh, this isn't work working a hundred percent of the time you have lost track of who you really are because so much of that is in our blind spot we cannot extract it ourselves we just can't right and the so it's really important though that you have someone who is trained who can help you extract that not your not your best friend not your family that love you they still are looking through their own variation of the microscope, someone who really is trained to be able to ask questions that help you see what has been begging to be seen all along. So that first piece is that identification piece. And then from there, you can identify what is next. What is that strategy? And look at what do we need to reboot and what do we need to recalibrate? And how can I learn at that point to play the inner game to win? And then the third part, which is usually what we put first, the third part is the unleash. That's all the outer game stuff of, you know, how do we help you with your personal brand? How do we turn you into an interview ninja? How do we, you know, put the strategies together? That's there, but it's not the first part because we take ourselves with us wherever we go. So if we take this version of ourselves that believes that we are destined to be our own worst enemy, then we are going to be our own worst enemy, even in our freaking dream job. 
and it won't last very long. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. How long are clients typically working with you? Is it different each time just because depending on you know what maybe package they buy or is it more kind of how long it takes you to get them to where you want them to, to be or where they want to be? Yeah, yeah. So that's a fabulous question. And the one of the misconceptions that I find a lot is that people sometimes come into the coaching with the same mindset that they would approach therapy with. So whereas therapy typically is taking you from someplace in the negative and trying to get you back to that set point, that zero spot, right? The reset. Coaching well done is taking you to the place that is limitless. It's limitless. So, but the beauty of the coaching is that it is helping you compress decades, sometimes into days because of the clarity, right? So if you want to go further, faster, with more clarity, with more exhilaration, if you want to get to the place where you cannot remember the last time you had one of those days and you want to get there faster, then that's where the coaching can really work. So therefore, the reason I share that with you is I have some clients who come with, I I have some clients who show up saying, I just want to be turned into an interview ninja. Okay, cool. That'll take approximately three to four sessions, right? However, what they end up often seeing is that, okay, we've turned you into an interview ninja. How do we make sure that again, three to six to 12 months later, you are not in the same place where you are now needing to be an interview ninja for some other thing going, why isn't this working, right? So there are plenty of clients who have come to me and seen such progress. I have one woman who came who was really dealing with confidence issues, what she saw for herself as far as the potential to be a leader. She was always being overlooked. She felt like people didn't appreciate her, like she was having trouble being heard. She went from there and and she she enrolled in a, I think the first time she enrolled in maybe eight weeks, Mm -hmm. right? However, even in that eight week period, she saw so much more growth in herself than she had seen in years that she re-enrolled. Well, now she has been, this woman has been my client for three years and within a three-year period in the public sector, which is typically very hard to get promotions in, she has had two significant leadership jumps. So she's way above where any of her peers would have expected her to be, much less are themselves. And for her, the investment that she has made is well above a $50,000 return for her, but not to mention that's the tangible stuff, the way she feels, because also simultaneously, she's dealing with a partner who is late stage cancer and, and having to deal with that. So theoretically, she's got all these reasons why she should really be going forward the way that she is. And yet she is. So, um, so it really does very, I find a lot of people see such progress personally, spiritually, and financially that often what we we begin something that looks like a shorter journey. And often the results are just kind of hard to let go of because you, again, we go further faster when we've got a team, right? Even if that team is your coach when you're hitting the speed bumps to help you more quickly find the gems in the speed bumps than you'd be able to do on your own. Well, how this conversation is going, I'm ready to sign up myself as soon as this conversation is (laughs) over. (laughs) Speaking of of that, how would listeners be able to sign up and engage with you and sign up for your services? Sure, absolutely. So two things. One, of course, you can go to my website, which is gritmindsetacademy.com. And you can, you know, if you put forward slash coaching, you go directly to my coaching page. 
And of course, so you can see what the various packages are. However, for your listeners, I would be happy to hop on a complimentary 20-minute strategy call for someone who knows that they fall in that category, knows that it's not only the the cost of quote unquote investment it's the the cost of inaction right the cost of repetition repeating the same thing over and over again how long do you want to be stuck on a hamster wheel so in order to do that and i will of course give you the link so you can post it in the notes but if you want to hop on a strategy call and you're listening right now you want some input you would go to bit.ly forward slash go epic now. And that's bit.ly forward slash go epic now. And I will be the first to tell you if I don't think the program is a good fit for you. And if it is a good fit for you, buckle your seatbelt and put on your astronaut helmet because we go far and fast and any bit of confidence and self-doubt that you have, I'll I'll fill in the gaps for you. I'll fill in the gaps until you, you've you got your running shoes on. Anyone listening, I highly recommend this. Meredith has changed so many lives and is highly rated. So uh, make sure you guys jump on that. Being that it's a complimentary call, what can hurt? You know, that is great. And it might be something that could really change your lives. So thank you for that, Meredith. Of course. So can you please give us a few takeaways of your new book that you wrote? A Hundred sure. Days of Epic. A hundred days of epic. Absolutely. So, so this book is really a result of clients saying, I would love to have 100 days of actionable steps to help me learn how to play the inner game and specifically to help me hone in on the three areas of mastery that will help me get there further faster. Those three areas are your focus. So this means, are you focusing on the presence of what you want or are you focusing on the lack of the presence of what you want? Most of us almost always believe we're focusing on what we want when almost always we are focusing on the lack of the presence. So It's actionable steps to really help you become the sovereign of your own focus, your own language. For example, let me show you, like so many people say, okay, yeah, well, my biggest, my biggest challenge is that I just can't get motivated right now, or I just can't figure out, or I just don't have confidence. It's always my biggest challenge, my biggest challenge. Well, I don't care if you say you love the word challenge in that context the underlying inner game frequency, that energy, emotional frequency, this is not booyah. This is, oh my gosh, this sucks. I remember all the times in my life that I have had challenges all the way time back to when I was trying to ride that freaking bike or whatever it was, right? You know, why can they do it? Why can they figure it out? And I can't. That challenge word holds a lot of invisible stories. But then we don't leave it there. We say my biggest challenge. Well, can you have your biggest challenge with just one challenge? No, you cannot. So what you have told yourself is, darling, you've got challenges. This just happens to be the biggest one. And then as they would say on the Home Shopping Network, but wait, there's more. (laughs) We don't say the biggest challenge, do we? We say, my biggest challenge. We bring it into who we are. We walk into the biggest opportunity of our lives. We put our hands out and we're like, hi, I'm Meredith with this big freaking challenge. And therefore, when the opportunity says, well, hello, I'm knocking at your door. My little inner code says, "Um, excuse me, excuse me, Meredith, Meredith, knock, knock. Remember who you are. You're Meredith with this big freaking challenge. Yeah. Right? Right. Yes. So then the third thing, well, wait, that's not fair to leave you cliffhanging. So the the obvious question, if you're a very astute listener, which I know you are, you're going, but wait a minute, but this is real. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go in the freaking bathroom and spread my arms and go, I am a money magnet. And my mind is going, have you checked your bank account recently? 
right? Are we supposed to lie to ourselves, fake it till we make it, Mm -hmm. right? Aha. So remember those three questions? What was the third question? What am I assuming that is not necessarily true, right? The assumption in that moment is that, okay, that's true, but is that the only version of truth? What if you were to say, my biggest opportunity right now is to figure out this freaking confidence thing and get my plan in place, execute, go forward, and figure out what that next big step is for myself. Or my biggest commitment right now is finally getting confidence so that I can go for it. I can do all these things that I know that I'm capable of and get out of my own way. That is authentic and true as well. It's just an awfully better version and more energizing and empowering. The other makes you pull the covers up over your head. This makes you, you know, if you're from my generation, put on your PF flyers or something like that, you're running out the door. So language can be really, really critical because it acts like programming codes. We must learn to become the sovereign of that. And then the third element is actually our imagination. Um, And that may sound a little weird because it is ruthlessly kind of whipped out of us at a young age, leaving only authorization to use our imagination to worry, to doubt, or to fear. Those are the primary uses that we're allowed to use this thing called imagination. And, And when we're fearing, most of the time we're allowing our mind unchecked to create a story about something that has never happened, that probably never will, and that definitely rarely is danger. It's not like we've jumped out of the airplane and go, oh, shoot, I forgot, right? Right. I mean, there's danger, which is very real, Mm -hmm. and there's fear, which, you know, I think... um, There are many different acronyms for it, but, you know, forget everything and run, whatever you want to call it. My favorite says it slightly differently. My favorite is false evidence appearing real. I'm always trying to tell my my kids that, but trying to explain that to an eight-year-old is a little bit difficult, but yeah. Well, here's the thing is is sometimes, so let's go back to language on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Often we're just mislabeling it. It's it's just um, a physiological sensation And what if rather than identifying that as fear, what if it's just unfamiliarity, Yes. right? And if you think about it, what if you want something that you don't currently have or you aren't currently experiencing, then it's not in your familiar experience, is it? It's in the realm of unfamiliarity. So unfamiliarity is your friend. And what's the antidote to being unfamiliar? Well, get out there and get familiar with it. It'll only be unfamiliar one or two times because after then, maybe even one time, right? Because after then, after that point, you start to have a level of familiarity and you, and you start to realize that you can master something that maybe looked impossible from the other side. Right. Thank you for that. I am definitely picking my book up hoping there's an audio version so I can hear you just narrate it because the energy you there bring will is... <laughs> be here is not yet there okay. will be but the but but maybe maybe this will make up for it it is gamified oh. so every single day you have the opportunity to download a little chart mm-hmm. and challenge yourself to keep track of points mm-hmm. and so you know it's uh we've tried to make it kind of fun you can tell I'm a very serious personality yeah, very stern. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No. Well, thank you so much. Honestly, I wish this conversation could go another two hours. So I do yes. have one more, yes. one more, yeah, one more question before we go. What advice would you give to future leaders of America who are looking to get into leadership roles, but maybe struggling due to boulders that they're facing in their current lives? The most important thing, if there's nothing else that you take from this is that the analogy is kind of like, when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, right? When is the second best time to plant a tree? Today, exactly. And 
the inner game, especially going forward into this era of what I call epic, it is going to be essential that you have that epic inner game, which means you're stepping out into the world through the lens of empowerment, purpose-driven, innovation, and collaboration. So the differentiating factor will be whether you prioritize right here, right now, learning to play your inner game to win and realizing that we have wasted so much time with the old approach of waiting for the world to change so that we can effortlessly feel better. We don't have to try it all. And we're, for whatever reason, we believe that working on our inner game is just too hard. It's going to be hard because I am who I am. Well, my question to you would be, first of all, how's it working out for you? And if it's not, isn't it hard waking up in the morning, feeling like you're stuck, feeling like you are totally vulnerable to what you encounter in your day, feeling like the world does not have your back, feeling like, yeah, I mean, just go on and on and on, feeling like you you are not you're not worthy that you've let yourself down that you've had so many quote unquote failures that you don't even want to try again. All these things are isn't that infinitely harder than saying, you know what? I'm going to take back the control. I'm going to try a new approach where I am the sovereign and my thoughts do not get to think me. And when you learn to do that, you began to really think like a leader. A leader is, is, has that own self-perpetuating confidence, right? And it's the confidence that I do not have to be the smartest person in the room. I do not have to know everything. I do not have to, quote unquote, be perfect. I can make mistakes. I can all of those things. The differentiating factor is that I know the value of my stories. I know what I bring to the table. And I know that you're going to be freaking lucky to have me at your table, just as I am freaking lucky to have you at my table. So now let's get down to the business and let's make it personal.